What is good, everybody? Welcome to the OG Gold Standard Podcast. I'm Rob Stats Guerrero. It's Thursday. So Levin Black is here. Hey, Levin. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be one of those episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that right off the bat. Come on. <laughs> I have worked, uh, let's see, 30 of the last 38 hours. Wow. Including 15 of the last, like, 15 and a half. I basically got home, put my kid to bed, who was waiting, staying up late because she didn't get to see me yesterday. And I put her to bed and came downstairs to talk to you, which, you know, it's just makes the day all that much better. Was there like a radiation leak at the plant or what's what's taking up all your time here? We don't have radiation, but we had an outage and uh, I was covering supposed to be my days off but i was covering for somebody on, on vacation who timed their vacation perfectly <laughs> before probably. the outage was known it wasn't like a big outage it was just we needed to replace a valve and uh the outage actually went well but a much more important can't run can't run half of our plant without it valve somehow broke despite it being no part of the outage and nobody touching it uh hmm. and so when we Went to start back up. Things did not go well. Nothing dangerous, but just couldn't run because we couldn't get this valve to open. And so then we had to run in a not fun state and stay late to get to that point and then come right back. because so we're allowed to work 16 hours. Like that's the company's like safety protocol. Like if you hit 16 hours, you're out the door. doesn't matter what's going on. Like a pilot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I had to go home, came back, you know, and eight hours later, which is the minimum it can be to get back. And, uh, they basically, in order to replace that valve, have to like do a bunch of stuff because it had like oil that you heat to get heat. So yeah. So it took a while. Draining it, you know, getting it, isolating it, draining it, getting all the heat out of it because it was, you know, really hot. All of that took all day. And then, uh, of course, right when my shift is supposed to be ending is when it's good to go. Let's flip back from running this not fun way back to normal and get back to normal. So then I had to stay late again. And now I have to cover tomorrow when I wasn't supposed to be because the guy that was going to cover tomorrow needed to come out tonight to be there to assist them in case there's any issues. So Fun week. I'm in a awesome mood. I can tell. <laughs> I am brain dead it's not that i'm angry i'm uh i've been literally scaring staring at screens and pressures for 30 hours watch out everybody 11's brain dead i don't know how you tell the difference but we'll try it's not uh, like your day was any better no it wasn't rate review and follow the gold standard podcast network i had to talk to grant today so yeah you had your first lover quarrel with grant you know <laughs> grant and baby cone baby cone's growing up and we got into it. I'll hey. say that on yesterday's show. It got a little heated. I'll say this as somebody that listened. It sounded uh, it got about as far as you can go into personal before lines are drawn and goes too far. Yeah. You guys, I, you, you guys are definitely getting to the point where you thought the other one, which I don't think either one of you really were, but you both thought the other one was like calling you out and saying like, no, you're just making it, you know, he was going to the, you were changing your opinion just to be more popular and you were going towards your being contrarian just to be contrarian type. It was a thing. It, it got say, close. Yeah. There were conversations after the show. I just want to say for the record, I'm a big Grant fan. Obviously we do a show every week. I have nothing but respect for him. Uh, just it got a little heated, which happens from time to time, which is fine. Right. That's why we thought it would be a good show uh, for people to listen to. So. It's the territory you're in when you go after somebody that's won as much as Kyle Shanahan. I mean. True. Uh, if you leave a review, we will read it on the show. This one comes from RDK BMT. Love it. Five stars. Love. Love it. Comma. Favorite Niners podcast. Levin and Rob's OG gold standard show is my favorite, but all are great. Even though I don't always agree with Grant, I love the energy here and Rob, he and Rob bring to the crossover show. There is a lot of energy on that show. That is 100% true. I got all your energy right here. <laughs> <laughs> on today's show, 
We're going to do our offensive preview. Last week, we did our defensive preview, which was very popular. And thank you, everybody that listened. Uh, if you want to go check that out, it's on the YouTube page, or you can download it wherever you get your audio podcasts. Uh, but today is the offensive show, which is perfect because I just finished listening to the Play Callers podcast series that The Athletic did all about Shanahan and McDaniel and McVeigh and all those guys. So I could have some little interesting nuggets to throw in because there was quite a bit of uh, juicy material in there, I have to admit. So let me say one thing, because, you know, I didn't get to talk to Grant, but there there was, you know, he was saying, why do they even have a podcast? And Andy Reid doesn't get a podcast about his coaching tree. And, you know, mm-hmm. Age. That's why. Andy sure. Reid is not of the age where he cares to do podcasts. And, <laughs> he, you know, he's of that age of coaches where they don't want to be media savvy. They want nothing to do with the media. And it's not that Kyle likes the media, but he is media savvy. He knows what to do, how to act around them. And he does have the ability to self-promote and do podcasts and shows. And when he gets to control what he talks about, you know, like right. a barbershop, like if, if he gets to have a conversation like a barbershop, he's all in. If it's, you're going to ask me questions and I have to answer, he doesn't like that. But that to me is the difference is because these four coaches are all very young and they grew up in a world where YouTube and stuff was the norm. So they, they do that. Whereas Andy Reid's not into self promotion, he doesn't. He's not going to go do a you know a podcast or TV show in his free time. He's going to be in a Hawaiian shirt, probably somewhere on a beach, eating a cheeseburger more yeah. more often than not. Uh, that's a good point. Um, and like we have talked about Andy Reid's coaching tree, by the way, it's it's been discussed. Oh, I, but I understand Grant's point is like they get they get a lot of coverage compared to how many Super Bowls they have, and that is fair. But yeah, that's not. Right talking about on today's show we're doing offensive preview today we'll go through position by position do you want to start with the quarterbacks or do you want to do the quarterbacks last i leave it up to you what the, we're going to talk about quarterbacks i know this team people are going to be mad <laughs> we can start wherever because it's going to end up there you know it doesn't matter if we start with something else we're going to be talking about a lot a lot of quarterback stuff because you know that, that's what this team is yeah, I agree. Let's start literally with- 25 years at this point. <laughs> I'm going to proceed from this point forward as if Brock is the quarterback week one right out of the gate, because that is the message that the team itself has pushed on everybody. And until we get some sort of negative update that gives us reason to believe that's not the case, I think that's the assumption we have to make. Is that fair? Yeah, at this point, I think it's much more likely than not. He's ready to go week one. So assuming he's ready to go week one, let's try and be fair and apply the same kind of standard like we were talking about last year. You and Michelle last year did a show whether or not Trey Lance could break the 49ers franchise passing record in a single Mm -hmm. season. Let's do the same thing with Brock. He's a young quarterback, obviously showed promise last year. Do you what are your expectations for Brock? Assuming he starts and plays a full season. If he plays all 17 games, he's going to have a very, very, very good shot at getting that passing record. The 49ers passing record is not that impressive. I think it's, I'm going off memory here, 4,270 yards, 78 yards by Jeff Garcia. Um, That's very doable in 17 games. 16 games, I think, swings it. But 17 games, let's see, if if Brock Purdy. What did you say the record was? 4,278. Holy crap, that is the record. <laughs> uh, there's a you reason why. Like memory? Uh, I like numbers. <laughs> okay. Good. Uh, so good Brock, I think, averaged 231 yards per start last season in his five games. Regular season, we're talking. Uh, well, in the nine games total, he averaged 152 yards a game. Well, Which is crazy because it's not that high. That's very low. 152 is skewed because one of those games he got knocked out. If you look at the no, – those were just the regular season games from last year. If you look at just the starts, he averaged, hang on, 219 yards per game. Okay. So that would be with 17 games, you're talking about uh, 3,740 yards if he gets 220. But I, I think he had 230, in, I thought, in the regular season games. But I guess I'm wrong. I'm misremembering that. That's correct. Um, but... <laughs> I think if he plays, typically the 49ers quarterbacks are 230 to 240 per game. That's a very consistent number throughout the tenure of quarterbacks. 
with or seasons, I should say, average for the 49ers. And if he gets to 230, he's at that 4,000 mark. And it's his second year. Ayuka is emerging. Debo had the worst career of his or year of his career, I would argue. Yep. So I think it's very likely Brock ends up pushing the 250 mark, you know, being in the high 240s. If I had to, if I had to guess, I, I don't know what Vegas has his over and under on if they have an over and on, under for him, but I'm guessing it's like right around 240. That puts the, him right at the record. The crazy thing is like he really did not throw for a ton of yardage. It was the he touchdowns. He was crazy at converting yes. drives into touchdowns, which he should be better than Jimmy, but he won't be at the rate that he was last year. But I, I do think think that this is the point I made last year. 17 games changes everything. We haven't seen 17 games from a 49ers quarterback. 17 games makes that record very, 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 very easy to hit if you start all 17 games. If Jimmy Garoppolo started all 17 games or had 17 games in 2019, the one season that he was healthy all year, he, I think he, if I, I calculated at one time, I think he ended up being like 30 or 40 yards short of that record. If he, if he had gotten 17 games rather than 16 in 2019, he was fourth all time, 39, 78 that year. Right. And one extra game, you know, because that was a 16 game season. Mm -hmm. He had the one extra 17 game. He's just over two, 4,200 yards. Yeah. He possibly, yeah, he, he is very, very close to the record. And that was, you know, that wasn't like a, Wow, he played amazingly well in that year. That's my point. Is like any quarterback that gets all 17 games with Kyle Shanahan is likely going to be somewhere in the 4100 to 4300 range, no matter what. The problem is we haven't had that except yeah. for one year in 2019. Yeah, Jeff Garcia threw for 267 yards a game the year he set the uh, all-time record. There's only been two 49ers quarterbacks that have ever thrown for 4,000 yards in a season. One is Jeff Garcia. The other is Steve Young. Yes, Steve Young. That's it. Like, And 4,000 yards is not what it once was. It's very, very achievable, as we just talked about in today's game. The touchdowns, that's the thing. Brock put up two touchdowns or more every start, pretty interceptions much. Interceptions right there. Does he have more of those bad throws turned into interceptions? Because he had a little bit better than average luck in that regard last year. The record for touchdown passes in a single season by a 49ers quarterback. Do you know that? Uh, I know it. 36? 36 is correct. My <laughs> God. You are on fire right now. Steve Young uh, put up 36 yeah. in 1998. Yep. Um, that I is knew, the record. I knew the year, too. And 98 is like my first year of like obsession with football. True, like all of NFL. First year of fantasy football for me. So that's what made me go boom in terms of interest. So the 1998 year is like locked in my head. That's Barry Sanders. You know, it was an incredible season. Yeah. So that's Barry Sanders last year. It's just a year that sticks out in my head that, because it's the first year. I don't think he's going to get the record for touchdowns, both because I think it. the Niners are going to run it more. Yep. And I just like he was on an ins it was an insane pace. He was throwing mm -hmm. two to three touchdown passes every single game, though. That generally doesn't happen for a variety of reasons. Sometimes right. you throw a pass and get tackled at the three and then you run it in some games right. that I mean, the tackle and you run it and you, he goes in for a passing touchdown. Right. At the pace that he was at, which like we're both saying, was a pretty insane pace for the amount of opportunities he actually had. But if he did stick with that pace for all 17 games that he did in the five games, I believe it it would be a 43 touchdown pace. That's not that much more than 36. So, like, I, I am personally expecting if he gets all 17 starts to be right around that 30 mark. I think he's probably going to push a yeah. little over 30, which, if I'm not mistaken, would only be uh, – the third quarterback, or sorry, I guess fourth quarterback ever for the 49ers to get 30 touchdowns because you have Montana, Steve Young, and Jeff Garcia. Those are the only three that I think have ever gotten to 30. There's one more. Is that really? Is it a John Brody's 30 touchdowns yeah. in 1965? Yep, 30 touch, which in 1965, 30 touchdowns was a lot. And by the way, that was only in 13 games. Um, 
But I mean, the 49ers have not had a 30 touchdown passer since Jeff Garcia. So it's been a long time. Like Jeff Garcia did it in 2001. That was the last time. It's 2023. Same year, the last 4,000 yard passer. It's insane. Right. It's so like they, they've gone 22 years in the most pass happy, easy to pass era in you know NFL history without having a 4,000 yard passer or a 30 down a touchdown passer. That's insane and speaks to why we talk about quarterbacks so much. <laughs> and yet <laughs> they went to two Super Bowls and what is it? Five NFC championship games in the last 10 years. <laughs> but literally, I think it's been half of the NFC championship games. It's insane. But yeah, that's why we talk about quarterbacks so much. That's why a lot of 49er fans out there talk about wanting to have a franchise guy, an elite guy, because we haven't seen that really since young Garcia put up some numbers, but nobody thought Jeff Garcia was going to be the long-term answer for the next 15 years when he was playing because of his age at the time. Put it this way, the 49ers and their fan base, there's not a single person because it hasn't existed. that got to experience having a true franchise, great quarterback in the era where you get to know everything about them, you know, in the internet era, Steve young, he came technically the internet was there towards the end, but it wasn't like, Oh, all the stats were readily available. You, right. you, you know, you had all these uh, nonstop content creation where you, you could get to know so many things. The video wasn't there to dissect. You couldn't watch somebody giving you the X's and O's of the, mm -hmm. of the we we've not had it to where if you're a star level NFL quarterback, you are going to be out there on social media. You're going to be in, uh, ads you're going to have all these things that put you in front of people we haven't had that where you get to be fully immersed in it we've had it where yeah i get to watch them on sundays you know and that's so, only probably a third of the fan base at this point that can yeah. truly remember vividly steve young so now going back to brock purdy 30 touchdowns would be awesome I would probably say 30 is probably the number that I would, assuming Over he starts 17. Yeah. yeah. 30, I think is the number, which I would be absolutely fine with, by the way, again, that would be a year. Like we have not seen from a 49ers quarterback in quite some time. I'd be down with that. I don't think it's unreasonable to expect him to throw 30. I don't. Um, I just, I, it's going to be really interesting to see how defenses react to him this year, as opposed to last year. I saw a stat by Warren Sharp that said that 91% of the 49ers runs last year came in a box with seven or more defenders. Mm -hmm. What that tells me is Brandon Ayuk season. That's well, defenses were like, we are not scared of anybody. You got back there. Defenses didn't care if it was Lance, Jimmy Garoppolo or Brock Purdy. They were saying we're stopping the run and we are, are going to live with you beating us with the pass. And I think that is part of the reason that Brock was able to throw so many touchdowns. I don't know that they're going to see those same defenses this year. I would wager they're not going to see. They're going to see less blitzing. And I think they're going to see less heavy boxes. And I think the defenses are going to make Brock prove that he can read coverage and deal with, with defenses when they are specifically trying to stop the pass. Now, before you jump down my throat, I'm not saying he can't do that. I'm just saying that's going to be the change in how the defenses play him. I got one caveat to that. All right. It's not necessarily, I think a lot of it is, but not all of it is that they loaded up the box to stop the run. It's that who were the two weapons that you needed to stop on offense? Christian McCaffrey in the second half and Debo Samuel. What do those two excel at? catches within five yards of the line of scrimmage. So you could have seven in the box and still cover them on most of their routes. And so it allows you to kind of cheat against the run, but still cover those two players as well as you possibly can. And so I think it's a little bit misleading that it was 91% because that doesn't necessarily mean that they were completely selling out to stop the run. And it's just because the Niners have perhaps the two best offensive weapons within five yards of the line of scrimmage. That's a fair point. So you're saying basically they're like, hey, even if you pass it, the other thing we're worried about is the short pass at or behind the line of scrimmage. Mm -hmm. So it works out to our benefit to have guys up in the box anyway. Right. Okay. I mean, when you I motion Debo into the backfield, what's the defense going to do? They're going to have seven in the backfield. 
how often did we see Debo motion into the backfield? A lot. You know, even when he wasn't running the ball, he still motioned in the backfield a good bit of the time. So that defender is going to come in and get counted as seven in the box. And we've seen we've seen Kyle use that to his advantage by having McCaffrey go deep coming out of the backfield or out of the slot. And we've seen it be successful. That's the juice one. You know, right. Yeah. Well, juice, but, juice gets open every friggin. Oh, my God. It's <laughs> unbelievable how he gets so open. But I, I'm not saying that the Niners wouldn't have been high on this list, but they were 91 percent. I think the, the next highest was like 85 percent. Like it, it was a pretty it big. Deal. Falcon, yeah, like 83 yeah. or 85, something like right. that. I, I think if it wasn't for the Debo effect and then later in the season, the, the uh, Christian McCaffrey effect, I think the Niners probably are still top five, but they're probably down there in the 70s. How much do your expectations for the quarterback position change if it's not Brock Purdy? if it's Lance or if it's Lance for like one or two, then Brock for eight, maybe Brock gets hurt. Lance has to come back in, you know, some combination thereof. Or do you think that basically the system is the system and all the quarterbacks would put up similar numbers? My expectations change. Absolutely zero. It's not because of the system It's because Brock and Lance, I think are at the same point. Prove it. Brock had a little bit more success. You know, no denying it, but it, it, there's still such small sample size. We're talking about eight games for one and like 3.1 games for the other. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a very small sample size. So they're both in this bag of, I think that they could be really good. You know, I, I think they have different levels in terms of highest upside they could reach in my mind. Mm -hmm. But I still, I, I have both of them in the book of, I think it's more likely than not they end up being good good enough to be the franchise guy that the team sticks with them. So my expectation doesn't change. I expect both of them. If they get to start the whole season to be pushing those 30 touchdowns, to be pushing that passing yards record. And it's not because of the system. It's just because of the expectations that they have currently, I think are very, very similar. Did you see the report? I don't want to call it a report because it was a tweet. Really? The tweet from somebody online that claimed that they knew that the Falcons had inquired about a trade for Trey Lance on Monday of this week. Um, did I see the tweet that you texted me earlier today? Oh, yeah. did I text it to you? Okay, well, then you <laughs> definitely saw it. Then. But I had already seen it, and I sent you the screenshot back of uh, – it was uh, Leo, Leo Luna, Luna, actually. I pulled up you some did. of the guy's history, and it seems to be one of those accounts that goes, okay, this is something that would be big news that has a decent probability of happening, so I'm going to tweet it out early so then I can go, ha, look, I was right later on maybe actually be believed as a credible person. I was, talk I, I was talking with Eric Crocker today because I sent him, uh, I did buy a trophy. Are you cheating on this network? How <laughs> dare you? <laughs> I bought a trophy because Eric won the 49ers Media uh -huh. Madness. So I bought it and it is now on his way to his house. And I just asked him like real quick, like, what do you, what do you make of this? And he brought up a really good point, which is basically the Falcons are either going with Desmond Ritter and maybe he turns into something or they're going to stink and they'll get a high draft pick and they'll get to take Caleb Williams or Drake may like they wouldn't be interested in Lance. Cause like, why do you want a 23, 24 year old quarterback that hasn't played that's super inexperienced when you could have Caleb Williams or Drake may like, so he doesn't think it makes sense for the Falcons to trade for Lance. And I thought that was a good point. I, I think it depends one, how much they believe in Desmond Ritter. And that doesn't mean that they believe, Oh, he's definitely going to be the franchise guy. But if they think he has a chance, then there's no point of making the trade for Lance. But if they <laughs> think, look, we don't think he's actually it. We just don't have a better better option. And the cost to get Lance is only a third-round pick, which is what you're kind of seeing thrown out there right now. To me, why not trade a third-round pick? Give Trey Lance a season. If he's not good enough, go get your quarterback with, with your next pick. Or if he is the franchise guy – now you got all kinds of leverage to do with whatever the heck you want to turn yourself into a true contender because the Falcons have a lot of good pieces. They're just missing some of the important pieces like quarterback. So I feel, I feel like that wouldn't necessarily be a bad strategy, even if they're going to have the high pick next year and they don't believe in Desmond Ritter. There's still the chance of why not spend a third round pick on Lance and see if we can get the flexibility in the draft that we want. But now you're talking about potentially if you use a third round pick, which you're assuming is going to be a high pick, relatively high pick, 
And if I you do so that, sure that, I think the Falcons are going to be a team that's around 500. Well, okay. But they, but still, let's say you use a third round pick and Lance doesn't work out. Then you're going to invest another pick, a first round pick in a quarterback again next year. Now you're using two picks on a, so it's a big investment. Who cares about a third round pick, a third round pick for a roll of the dice. Nice. If, I, <laughs> if you have a, a third, if you only have to invest a third round pick to have a roll of the dice, that gives you a decent chance of having a franchise quarterback. You do that every single time. If you don't have a current franchise quarterback, franchise quarterback is one of those things. You take every roll of the dice you have until you have a franchise quarterback. That's why the Niners drafted Purdy in the seventh round. You know, I I wouldn't have had a problem if they drafted a quarterback in the fifth round instead of the seventh round last year, you know, because you always invest in the quarterback until you have a guy that is proven. Is there anything else about the quarterbacks you want to say before we move on? Can one of you just be the guy, please? Right. Will the, will the franchise quarterback please stand up? Please stand up. Please stand up. <laughs> I mean, next offseason might be boring as hell if there's no quarterback to talk about. I the would whole welcome it. Please. <laughs> that's we... where I think all of us that do, whether us content creators, the beat reporters, the coaches on the team, the players on the team, or the fans, we are all sick of having to talk about it. So just one of these guys come forward so that nobody has to deal with who's the quarterback next offseason. Let's go to running backs now. I think the Niners have probably the best running back room in the entire league, quite honestly. Their third string running back could absolutely be a starter for a lot of teams out there. And that's saying something about the quality of the room. Christian McCaffrey, Elijah Mitchell, Jordan Mason, Plus, we don't know uh, what Tre- what's his name. Ty Davis Price is still there, and you know one of these undrafted guys may step up and be on the roster. It is a very, very deep running back room, and it all starts with Christian McCaffrey. Yeah, and I think it goes Jordan Mason after that. <laughs> there's been um, there's been little th- little things that have come out. Some from credible people, some from others that you don't know if they are yet credible because they haven't had too much of a history that are saying watch out for Jordan Mason like he might actually siphon some carries from Christian McCaffrey this year uh I think I, Eli, I think Eli Mitchell's not gonna be on this team I, I, I don't even think that's a bold prediction I don't think he'll be on this team it's like I said when you're talking about a backup especially somebody that's potentially the third string you got to have a guy that you know will be available if you need him. And that's not Eli Mitchell. So at this point, as long as TDP steps up or one of these undrafted rookies, which every single year, one of them ends up being, you know, something, something worthwhile. You don't want to let them go to keep Eli Mitchell when you can't trust him to stay healthy. It's not to say that I think Eli Mitchell is bad. It's that when you're talking about a backup, you need to make sure he's available. You can't have a third string that's never available. Right, because then you need a good fourth string. That was why I, I kept saying that Jimmy Garoppolo... You don't want to waste the roster spot. Right. That's not the thing. I kept saying Garoppolo was not insurance for Trey Lance because he always got hurt too. And what happened? He got hurt and they needed Brock Purdy. Your insurance guy can't be a guy that has trouble staying healthy. It doesn't make any sense. I threw up Elijah Mitchell's uh, stats on the screen there. You could see, look, one start was only active for or only played in four other games after week one. Uh, it, it was frustrating because he's really good when he plays. He's really good. He's just he's a tough runner. He runs with speed and power, all that stuff. But he just hasn't been dependable. And it's frustrating because I would love for the 49ers to have a dependable backup running back just to take some of the load off Christian McCaffrey. Keep that up for a second. Okay. There's a key part of what you have on the screen that tells me he will not make this team. What do you think it is? Uh, he didn't have more than nine carries after week nine. Zero special teams snaps. If you're going to be a second or third string, fourth string guy on this team, you better be able to play on special teams, and he doesn't. And that is how Jordan Mason sort of won over the coaching staff is that he did play on special teams. You know, it's like they they always say, like, the more stuff you can do, right? The more versatility you have, the better your chances of making the team and having a role. Well, 
Jordan Mason did. They can't put Elijah Mitchell on special teams. They're afraid he's going to shatter. Well, special teams are very hard collisions all the time. So yeah, you don't you don't want an injury prone guy doing that. That I just don't think he makes this team. He, he doesn't bring what you need a backup to bring, which is reliability, meaning availability, and the ability to play special teams. He doesn't check either one of those boxes. I make a bold prediction. I think no. we're going to see a thousand thousand season from Christian McCaffrey. Is that crazy? Uh, no, because there's going to be a lot of, oh, uh, I got nothing here. Here you go. <laughs> Check down. <laughs> Thank you for the eight yards in the first down that you got. Somebody's me. unblocked from my third string tight end. Here you go, Christian. Only Christian. three guys have ever done it in the history of the NFL. Yeah. One of them is already was a Niner. So one is Roger Craig. Falk. One is McCaffrey himself, yeah, Falk. and the other, Falk. Yes, Marshall Falk. That's it. It's only. It doesn't happen. I wasn't saying the F word. I was saying Falk. Hey, with you, I can never tell. <laughs> I think he's going thousand thousand. First of all, a thousand yards is like sixty yards a game, so it's not like this incredible feat. Especially now with the seventeenth game, it's even less actually because I haven't actually done the numbers with seventeen. And you right. know McCaffrey's going to get pass attempts, and he's going to break. He usually breaks a 15 or 20 yard run every game. So it's not like he needs a ton of carries to get there anyway. I think he's going thousand thousand this year. I really do. I mean, he should. It, it, this is going to be his offense. Yes. That's, there's no other way to put it. He's he's not just going to be, oh, he he's kind of the main guy on this. Op- no, he is going to be the offense. Yes, other guys will be good and put up some stats, but everything, both passing game and running game, will revolve around making the defense respond to Christian McCaffrey and creating everything off of that. I totally agree with you. It's going to be, okay, where's McCaffrey? He's lining up in the backfield. Now he's motioning out. Now he's going to the slot. Okay, that means we got to move this linebacker here, bring this safety down here. It's all going to be about him. He's going to be the guy that defenses look at every play. Where is he? As soon as they break the huddle, where is he? Where is he lining up? Now, where is he before the snap? Because Kyle always changes that picture on you. They motion McCaffrey. They put Debo in the backfield. They shift. They do all those things. He's going to be the guy that defenses focus on, and I just hope they keep him healthy. They were able to do it last year, which, by the way, Kyle Shanahan doesn't get any credit for that, right? Oh, it's Kyle Shanahan's fault all these quarterbacks get injured. Christian McCaffrey couldn't stay on the field the last two years. He stayed on the field with the Niners. So, like, again, are we going to give Kyle credit for that? No, 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 we don't do that. We only ding him. We all, It's only bad. I'm just throwing that out there. But, yeah, I think he's going 1,000-1,000. Uh, I don't disagree with your Elijah Mitchell idea that he might not be on the team, but I think the Niners will be just fine at running back, even if it's Jordan Mason as the backup and either Ty Davis Price or or Kalen Laybourne, whoever the hell they get to fill in. I just have faith. They know what they're looking for. Bobby Turner knows what he's looking for, and he hasn't steered us wrong yet. I would put it this way. It is a stone-cold lock. Either uh, TDP or Eli Mitchell does not make the team. Agreed. Book it. I, I do not think both of them make the team. One of them will, but not both. That's the most reasonable thing you've said all show. It is a lock. One of them makes the team. And it is a lock. Both of them do not make the team. All right. Before we get to the other sexy parts of the team, let's go up front to the big uglies on the offensive line. You and I were very worried going into last season about the offensive line because there were major question marks at both guard positions and at center, quite frankly. The whole interior of the 49ers offensive line, they were major questions. What did we find out? We found out that Aaron Banks can be a serviceable starter at left guard. We found out that the 49ers had a center that could play as a Pro Bowl alternate, which we did not think was was uh, likely, let's say, going into the season. And we found out that the combination of Spencer Burford and Daniel Brunskill at right guard was good enough. And McGlinchey, of course, was at right tackle. Now McGlinchey's gone. Aaron Banks is there. Spencer Burford's going to get the whole show at right guard. How are you feeling about the all line this year? I have more faith this year. I think that's the way to put it. I am giving them the faith because last year 
I didn't, and they proved me wrong to a degree. Um, I, I'm lukewarm on Colton McKivitz, but I'm going to believe that they're right. But I still think the potential is there because if they are wrong, that is the Achilles heel to this, the, this <laughs> offense. Yeah. This offense will not be the you know great top five offense we all think it, it should be if that right tackle is a turnstile. That's if fair. Mike McGlinchey is noticeably better than whoever plays right tackle this year, we will have problems as an offense. My... We will attack and stack that side. Oh, yeah. They, I mean, he's going to face the and, other team. And teams. Kittle will have his worst year because Kittle will be blocking every single play. Yeah, that's because other teams are going to say, hmm, do we want to send our best pass rusher against Trent Williams or do we want to send it against Colton McKivitz? Williams, McKivitz. Mm, oh, you know what? Let's try McKivitz. I, also, I, I should say, the one thing I will criticize them on is the depth. It's fine if you want to believe in Colton McKivitz, but he didn't bring anybody in. And the guy that's there as the backup, we've seen, and it's not good. Jalen Moore. Right. Jalen Moore. No faith in that guy. And it's not like Trent Williams is getting any younger. And he has been banged up a good bit. He's been able to play through it most of the time. With yeah. The 49ers, but, like, he is constantly on the verge of missing games. Questionable. You don't know what he's going to be. Uh, I just, that scares me. And that's fair. And I, it's fair to wonder about the depth. I said in the past that I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt because they earned that. And I wasn't going to criticize them. So I'm not going to do it here. But I think everything you bring up is fair. I think at right tackle, what I would say is I think that McKivitz actually has a higher floor than Mike McGlinchey, but a lower ceiling. I know that we got on McGlinchey for some bad plays, and there were some. Absolutely. Like, Micah Parsons put him parallel to the ground at one point. Like, he got shoved around sometimes. But he also had some really good plays where he gets out on the edge and he's clearing a path. And like that was a thing that happened also. I don't know that that McKivitz is going to be able to do some of the high level things that McGlinchey did. But I also don't think Colton McKivitz is going to get completely just absolutely bamboozled at right tackle the way McGlinchey did sometimes. Okay, now I just feel weird. Because when you paused there looking for the right word, the word that came to my head was bamboozled. And then you said it. <laughs> <laughs> and what are the chances of that? <laughs> There's a mind meld going on. It's freaking yeah, me polar out. Polar opposite of what you had earlier today. Yeah, I'm not entirely comfortable with it. I'm not going to lie. But look, this line, well, let me ask you before I say it. Do you think this line is in better shape than last year or worse shape going into the season? Equal. I have less confidence in Colton McKivitz because it's an unknown. You know, McGlinchey, I wasn't a huge fan. They needed to move on, I think, this offseason. They couldn't pay him what he got. Yeah. He was somebody that had – the consistency was not there. Like you said, he had dominant plays and he had horrendous plays where <laughs> me and you could have had more of an effect just diving in somebody's legs. <laughs> like, he, he didn't have the consistency, but overall, he's an average to above average uh, right tackle. McKivitz, I don't know what he's going to be. But I have more more confidence because I know what Banks is. I have confidence now in Burford because I know that he can play. You know, he wasn't great last year. But I think he can be at least serviceable from what I saw. And he could end up being really good. I think he has that potential. I think he has a unique skill set. Like, he has a high upside, I would, I would argue. So I think it's pretty equal. I'm a little more confident on the interior. And the exterior is... An unknown. So how could I be feeling better or in the same spot as I did last year when you had two established guys? But if I told you the Niners were going to lose Mike McGlinchey in the offseason, you'd go into this season feeling just as good about the line as you did last year. That's pretty good, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I would have said that I feel that that was unlikely. You know, if you asked me that last year going into the season, because I didn't have, like I said, I don't know what Colton McKivitz is. I'm just having faith this year because they've proven me wrong. So you got to adjust and not always say, hey, I don't like what's over there. I thought he 
didn't look great in the opportunities he's gotten, then maybe yeah. he learned. So that that's why I, I'm kind of I didn't like what I saw in the little bit that we've seen of him, but the team is confident enough that they literally didn't make a move at all in the offseason. Didn't really even draft a guy to truly compete. Nothing. So that tells me I should probably just see how it goes. Yeah, I think that's where I'm at too. Like we will see where it goes. I'm interested to see because I think the past couple of years, if you go back and look at the offensive line play at the beginning of the season compared to the end of the season, they were much, much better at the end of the season than they were at the beginning. For some reason, it takes them a long time to get in a groove and to gel and to get on the same page. That's part of the reason why the Niners have started so slowly under Kyle Shanahan. You can't have that this year. Come out of it, especially if you want that number one seed, you're competing with the Eagles for the number one seed. You got to come out of the gate ready to go. Look, Williams was there last year. Banks was there last year. Brendo was there last year. Burford was there last year. There's only one new guy on the offensive line. You shouldn't need four, five, six weeks to gel. You should be ready to go, and I'm going to be looking at that next year early on. They better be ready because week one is probably a top five <laughs> defensive line in the league. So Yeah. Like, be ready. Are you gonna otherwise, otherwise our whoever's starting a quarterback – is not going to be starting week two. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're not wrong about that though. That literally could be a thing, and we'll see. And hopefully they can. But yeah, uh, no I time. am very scared because I feel like this is a game that if McKivitz isn't on it right off the bat, T.J. Watt's going to have some like four sack game. Yeah, he could wreck. They the will just say, "Hey, T.J., you're going to be right over here, lined up off it." opposite McKivitz and we're going to run everything else and blitz on the other side so that they can't roll coverage over to help. And that's, here's the thing too, is like after a series, he's going to go to the sideline. Watt's going to go to the sideline and be like, yeah, that guy can't block me. I'm staying over there. I'm not saying that that's what it's going to, I have no idea what McKivitz is going to be, but if he's not like coming out of the gate being serviceable, he is going to have a very, very bad day. Baptism because by fire. A top three pass rushers on that opposite sideline. Yeah, it, it could get ugly fast. Uh, but we'll see. Maybe he will hold his own. We don't know. But it's definitely a stiff test in week one. Let's go to wide receivers now. And this is probably one of the juicier spots on the 49ers roster. We all know Debo, Ayuk, Jennings. That's pretty, pretty much set in stone at this point, barring an injury. Then you've got Ray Ray McLeod. You've got Danny Gray. How do things, you've got Ronnie Bell now, who they drafted this year. The intrigue with the 49ers receiving core, I feel like, starts at number four. Do you think that Jennings has that number three spot secured, or do you think that somebody may steal it from him? I do not think he has it secured. No? Oh, okay. What is Jennings' bread and butter? Third down. Short yardage, third down. With McCaffrey not needed anymore and we saw that like Jennings fell off towards the end of the year I think Ray Ray is going to end up being the third leading receiver really I think Ray Ray's speed brings something that only Ayuk brings so I well, think they're going to utilize if he, if he ever sees the field <laughs> true <laughs> I, I think Ray Ray is going to be the guy that also gets deep shots, you know, when Ayuk needs a breather, he's going to replace him. Uh, and also just having deep shots built into this offense because he he's a returner, so he's great when he has the ball. I think Ray Ray ends up being the third leading receiver. I think Jennings has a similar role. It's just not going to be needed as much because you have the Christian McCaffrey safety valve that's never going to be taken off the field. So that that to me is going to hurt Jennings. Well, it's a fair point because you can put McCaffrey out there and then you could say, like, do we want to have Juwan Jennings on as the four or do we want to have a guy who's just literally lightning fast in McLeod or Danny Gray? You probably opt for McLeod or Danny Gray, frankly. It's not like Juwan Jennings has super glue hands. Also, he drops a lot of passes. So that might be a fair assessment for the record because Michelle always dings him. I like Juwan Jennings. I'm a Juwan Jennings. I like him, too. Uh Considering that they drafted him in the seventh round, I think they got more out of him than you could reasonably hope for many seventh round pick. Like he had a significant role on this team as a third down receiver the past two seasons. 
Uh, I like him, but yeah, his role is is probably not secure by any stretch of the imagination. Right. And if you look at what you pulled up there, he had an average of three targets per game in the Brock, uh, Brock Purdy starts. Three per game. Like He's just not going to be getting that many opportunities. And I don't think it's his fault. I think he's still somebody that I'd be perfectly happy being the third option wide receiver on a team. It's just I think Ray Ray brings more of what they're going to want out of that third option. I feel exactly the same way about Jawan Jawan Jennings as I felt about Kendrick Bourne. Fine player. Love having him on the team. Absolutely is a role for him. Do not pay that man any more money than you are paying him right now. <laughs> and the fan base overvalues him. Yeah. Let it like they haven't missed Kendrick Bourne. Haven't missed him at all. Not in any way, shape, form, or fashion. And that's the same thing when Juwan Jennings' time comes, let him go. And we don't say that to be jerks. It is what it is. Like, not everybody's a star. Right. They are very good players. Guys, I'm happy if they are on my team. I just don't want to pay them more than minimum. Like, I feel like I would rather draft a guy in the late rounds and see what they have or sign, because there's so many wide receivers in this league, sign somebody for peanuts to replace them and you can get as good or, you know, close to the mm-hmm. same value and skill and ability. It's just not a difference maker. So let's talk about Debo and Ayuk. Everyone. I feel like at least Niner fans would tell you that they expect Debo to be better because Debo himself said I was awful last year. I'll never put anything like that on film again. But does better necessarily mean what we saw from Debo in 2021? Hell no, because that is like a truly, that is a unique season. It's not just like, oh, he had 1,400 yards. It's 1,400 yards on 77 receptions. That's rarely been done in the history of football. Yeah, that is ridiculous. You can't expect that to be anywhere close to the norm. He's not going to break all these screens for 50 yards like he did that year. That's why he got to the 1,400 yards. And he did it on, like you see there, 121 targets representing 1,400 yards. That's just not going to be repeatable. Not to mention the 365 rushing yards and the eight rushing touchdowns. Eight. That is such a high number. I don't think we'll ever see that again from him. I think because the league is determined to stop that from happening. But I don't need that from Debo. What I need from Debo, give me 1,000 yards. Give me a thousand yards and be the running threat and the, you know, just the kind of general sort of worry spot for the defense that you have been. And that'll be fine because I think Ayuk is the one that's going to shoulder the burden of the receiving duties for the Niners in 2023. So Debo doesn't need to be 1400 yard guy. Give me a thousand yards. Give me six to eight receiving touchdowns and a couple rushing touchdowns and you're good. Yeah. So I, I just don't see him getting the volume to be able to put up a monster season. There's too many options and he's not good enough deeper down the field. He is tremendous with the ball in his hands. He is tremendous in the short yardage. You get him past 10 yards and he becomes below average at best as a wide receiver. He's not good at those deeper routes. He's just not. And I think that's going to limit it because other people will get those opportunities. He's not going to be able to have the volume and opportunities to put up a monster 1400 yard season. I think he's somebody that, you know, his uh, yards per target last year was horrendous at 6.7. It was 11.6 the year before. I don't think that's realistic, but the two previous years, he was 8.9 and 9.9. That is where I think he falls. He falls somewhere within that range in yards per target and he's going to get around 120, 130 targets. So you're looking at somebody there that's right around the 1,000-yard mark. It's interesting. If you look at him as a rusher last year, he had the one big run against the Seahawks. That was pretty much all his rushing yards in that game. He had 52 rushing yards against the Bears. And then the rest of the year, he never even hit 40 yards rushing in any game. Yeah, I, hot. I pointed that out when we were, I think it was during the playoffs, uh, that he, he only had 127 rushing yards after week two. 127 rushing yards in the final 15 games. 
the Debo is a running back thing. I think teams were so aware of it. That's a, like we always talk about with the quarterbacks, how defenses adjust. All they did last offseason, they were like, we got to figure out a way to stop this guy. And they did. It worked. The, the, so- D, the Debo is a running back thing. This is what I think it, it became at the end of last year and what it will be. We're going to try it once. And if the team is going to sell out to stop it, we're not going to do it again. <laughs> if they decided, hey, they haven't been running this much, we're going to worry about other things, we're going to have a big Debo game. That's fair. Even in the playoffs, 32 yards against the Seahawks rushing, 11 against Dallas, negative nine against the Eagles. But again, take that with a grain of salt because of everything that happened. But And they don't need Debo to be the running back either. Not when you have Christian McCaffrey. Debo became a running back that year because they had nobody else. They needed somebody that could break off a big play, and that's what he provided. They don't need that anymore. Just be a receiver, and let's go. Now, Michelle Maju could talked about all last year how Kyle was basically throwing the ball to Debo at or behind the line of scrimmage way too often. When I talked to Oscar Aparicio, he said he thinks part of the reason that happened is because Debo was out of shape, that Kyle knew he couldn't get open down the field, and they wanted to get the ball in his hand. Debo looks much better this offseason. He looks a little slimmer. He himself has talked about wanting to be better and all of that stuff. So if that is the case, great. Give me 1,000-yard Debo, and I will be just fine. Off topic. Probably yeah. the, my favorite thing that you do when you say stuff, the way you pause and then you emphasize it. <laughs> <laughs> every what? time you do it, you just did it. But every time you do it, I was like, damn it. That's a good way to do it because it really like draws in attention because it like throws you off because you have a pause and then a super <laughs> heavy emphasis on the next word. Wow. That, I mean, I don't know if my headphones are working properly. That almost sounded like a compliment. Hey, are you on the radio? You should do radio. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. All right. Let's go to Ayuk now. Everybody's talking about Brandon Ayuk. He's everybody's favorite player. All the 49ers players are talking about how good he looked at minicamp. And he's going to be the breakout guy. And he's in a contract year. What does that actually look like in terms of numbers on the field, though? I think 1,200 yards. That's that's what I'm hoping he does this year. I think I think it's doable. I think I think he's I think he's going to lead the team in receptions for sure, in my opinion. Unless it's Christian McCaffrey because he gets so many dump offs. But I, I think he's going to be in that high 80s to low 90s receptions, and he's going to be up at the 12. 1200 plus yard mark to me with the amount of options this team has if you put up 1200 yards on this team you had a great year (laughs) and as little as shanahan passes you know if he went and played on kansas city that passes so much more or a buffalo that passes so much more any number one wide receiver on one of those offenses is going to get 150 plus targets in the season Oh, I thought you were going to keep talking. No, um, I, I was actually distracted here because I had not realized this. This is a good way to put it. He had a thousand yards receiving on less targets than Debo had 600 yards receiving. Yeah, I mean, he had 115 targets last year. He almost doubled Debo's receiving yards on less targets. Because he was getting thrown the ball down the damn field. And <laughs> Debo wasn't because he can get open down the field. If I was gonna, if I was on if another, that was, team, if that was true, if Debo got so many easy short yardage catches, his catch percentage would have been higher. Well, Ayuk had the higher catch percentage. If I was a fan of another team and I was like, I'm tired of hearing about this Brandon Ayuk, I would look at his numbers from last year and I would say, look, this guy had a 100 yard game last year. Okay, he had barely over a thousand yards. He had eight touchdowns. What are they talking about? Who is scared of Brandon Ayuk? Why am I shaking it in my boots thinking of Brandon Ayuk? Now, for the record, I don't think that way, but that's what I would say if I looked at another receiver on a different team and saw these numbers. Oh, it's completely true. Every team has somebody on the offense that their team, their fan base, like, this guy is so good. And then you go look and go, what the hell has that guy done to deserve that much support? (laughs) Ayuk's in there. Like, you look at these numbers, you go, yeah, I mean, that. That's a good receiver, but he didn't even have any catches. He barely got to a thousand yards. Why is this guy be, being talked about as one of the best route runners in the entire league by national media? I completely understand that take. 
if you're not somebody that watches and follows this team really closely, yeah, that that is a very logical opinion to have because you don't get to read all the practice reports and the teammates on defense going, the guy can't be guarded. You don't see, you know, the, the crazy route where he dropped a guy because you don't watch every single 49ers game. So I completely understand that take. I just know that Ayuk is a great wide receiver. But don't you think if he is that good, considering they have a play caller like Kyle Shanahan, shouldn't they get the ball in his hands more? Shouldn't 1,200 yards be kind of not disappointing, but like shouldn't 14, 1, 15, 1,600 yards be the expectation if he is that good? What is Kyle going to do? What do you know about Kyle's risk taking? Ugh, I know. He doesn't. He doesn't. What, what, what's more risky? A short yardage pass to a crazy good difference maker like Christian McCaffrey or Debo Samuel or trying to complete the 20 yard pass to IU? Which one's more likely to get caught and have some kind of positive effect? The short one. That's why. You know, it's funny. I've been listening to the uh, Play Callers podcast series that The Athletic just put out. Jordan Rodrigue did a really, it was a really interesting job interviewing Shanahan and McVay and Matt LaFleur and Mike McDaniel and all those guys. Kyle literally says, there's a quote from Kyle in this because they interviewed him. And he says, I always want to be aggressive. I always want to go for it. But as I've gotten older and gotten more mature, I realize that, you know, I got to protect against my own personality. And I'm sitting there just pulling my hair out. Like, Kyle, first of all, you can't have it both ways. You can't say I'm really aggressive, but also really conservative. Like, you're either one or the other. And I only care about what you actually do in games. I don't care about what you think about doing. But, like, stop telling me that you, you're you this aggressive guy when you're not. You're not this aggressive guy. You can do whatever you want out there, Kyle. And you choose the conservative thing every time. He needs to go with the more aggressive thing. But I just, I heard that and it just, I screamed when he said it because I was so mad. Kyle has a completely warped sense of what is aggressive. Because <laughs> to me, he thinks every time he play, makes a play call, it's the perfect play call. And there's, as long as the quarterback and well, we've heard him say it, well, if it's executed correctly, it would work. So every single time he makes a play call, he thinks it's zero risk as long as people do their damn jobs, right? So Fair. he doesn't he doesn't see himself as being conservative because he thinks every every play call he makes is aggressive. So when he doesn't go for it on fourth down, that's only one one play out of the, you know the forty or fifty offensive plays he has. I think he has a complete warped sense of what is aggressive because he thinks everything he does is. I, I, don't, I don't know how to sum it up perfectly, but do you do you get what I'm saying? Like, I, I feel like he has a complete warped sense because he thinks everything he is going to call is the absolute perfect thing and there's no better option no matter what. And it's right. all the players' fault if it doesn't work. Sometimes it does feel like that for sure. Um, and we'll see if he it's changes. I've said it multiple times. Well, if it was executed. Well, it's it was executed, right? I almost feel like he would be more aggressive if the defense was worse. And maybe we see that this year. If the defense isn't as good, maybe Kyle does get more aggressive. But I think in his mind, he always thinks like our defense will stop him. You know, we don't need to we don't need to overreach. Our defense is good enough. We'll stop him. And it's like that's the opposite attitude you should have because you have a defense that stops teams so often. You shouldn't be afraid to go for it because if if you turn it over on downs, You've got the defense to stop them from turning that into a score, but that is not how he sees it. And until that changes, it, it, he's going to keep trotting the field goal kicker out. A rookie one this year. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. All right, let's get to tight ends. Of course, you can't talk 49ers tight end without talking about George Kittle. He had a huge resurgence, at least touchdown-wise, last year coming on, catching almost a quarter of his career touchdowns after Brock Purdy took over. Two touchdowns against the Seahawks, two against the Commanders, one against the Raiders, two more against Cardinals down the stretch in the regular season. It was a George Kittle that we have been hoping and praying for for years. Do you think that continues next year? Not to that degree. I, I think he ends up with a you know, a seven to nine touchdown season. But, you know, if you take those Brock games and you go, 
Well, if he's anywhere near that, he's got a 10 plus touchdown season. I'm I'm not convinced he gets to 10 plus. He could I think he'll get to 10 plus touchdowns because I think Brock actually looks for him in the red zone and Brock has the um mobility to extend plays to potentially get Kittle open even if he's covered initially. But the yardage is the thing. Even look at George last year. He didn't put up a ton of yardage. There are a lot of games. 28 yards, 24, 26, 23, 29. He didn't really explode for yardage. He only had 765 yards last year. I don't expect that to change. But I do think the touchdowns, I think 10 or 11 touchdowns for Kittle is reasonable. Brock looks for him. He's been able to find him. Even when he's not the first read, we've seen Brock bail out of plays and look for Kittle anyway. We've seen George steal touchdowns from other players. I think Kittle will be up in that 10-11 touchdown range, but I still think he's going to have games where he just utterly disappears from a receiving yardage perspective. That's definitely going to happen. If they face a team that has a great pass rush, like in week one, I don't think Kittle's going to get that many opportunities because he's going to stay in and block. Yep. By the way, uh, Kittle, average yards per target. He had more than Kelsey last year and the year before. Yards per target, not yards per reception. Correct. Yards per target. Kelsey had 150 targets last year. (laughs) Kittle had half of that at 86. Like, if Kittle was on an offense that passed more and didn't have all of these options, Kittle would be getting the 120, 130 targets that these top tight ends get, and he would be having the years that we all think he should be having. Not that it's his fault, but like we all think Kittle's the best tight end in the league. He should be having you know 11, 1200 yard seasons every year, like the top tight ends. He doesn't because he doesn't get the opportunity to. It's not because he can't. I will say this. I'm done with the excuses. Like, if this is not a top five offense, something's gone wrong. Like, I don't care if it's Brock. I don't care if it's Trey. I don't care if it's Sam because you picked Sam. So you're telling me you think he can do it. So I'm not going to give you that as an excuse because you picked Sam. You didn't end up with Sam Darnold on your team because of a church raffle. So I don't care. Where the hell did that Sam Darnold thing that you sent me come from? I can't remember off the top of my head. Oh, it was from the Pardon My Take podcast, I think, or it was a Barstool podcast that he was on. where he Yeah, couldn't... where he's talking about how Kittle's house is haunted and he's it's being cool. serious. Like, my God. Like, he literally was scared to stay at Kittle's house because uh, it, it's Sam. so illogical. He said, you know how some... <laughs> I'm literally reading that and I'm dumbfounded because he literally says, you know how sometimes they say people wake up and they're still kind of paralyzed from their sleep because... It's actually a chemical your, your body produces to paralyze your body so you don't injure yourself acting out your own dreams. That's what that is, where you wake up and you can hear things and you're mentally aware, but you can't move. And then he goes on. So he knows it's like an actual like medical true thing that science easily proves is an actual like thing. It's not paranormal. It's and go- then he goes, I woke up in the middle of the night and I couldn't move. I could feel something was there. His house is haunted. It's like, my God, like I, I'm trying to be nice because I want it. Like my brain is saying, how, how? What was your IQ score to think that? Hey, there's this medical condition, and then it happened to me, and it was a ghost. <laughs> Stop talking about ghosts, Sam. Like, holy hell! Please just shut up about ghosts. He did say that though. That's a legit thing. He li- he really thinks that uh, that George Kittle's pool house is haunted. So okay, that's fine. But whatever, like. Unless everybody gets injured on this offense all at the same time, I don't want to hear the excuses. Top five offense. You've got Debo, you got Ayuk, you got Kittle, you got McCaffrey, you got Mason, you drafted a zillion tight ends. Like enough. Let's see it. I don't want to have these 19 point games, these 12 point games early in the season. Screw that. 25, 30 points a game. Let's go. Enough. Like right out of the gate. I don't care that Pittsburgh is a good defense. Enough. I got to see it week in and week out. And I don't know if we will, but I'll be watching. The other thing I don't want to hear is, oh, it just takes us a long time to get going every year. You know, we we're hitting our, I forget how Juice put it when we interviewed him. Like, oh, we feel like we, 
we figured things out this week, and it's like week seven. Figure it out in week one, God damn it. <laughs> sick of these slow starts. I'm sick yeah. of being five weeks into the season going, what the heck is happening? We're we're a contending team. Now I got to sweat all year whether or not we're going to make the playoffs. Can you just come out like 2019? Like, don't make 2019 the outlier. Make that the norm. That's fair. And look, we'll throw up the schedule. Steelers week one, yeah, that's going to be tough. You should kick the tar out of the Rams in week two. You should kick the tar out of the Giants in week three. You should kick the tar out of the Cardinals in week four. So there you go. That's three cupcakes on the schedule. Dallas week five won't be easy, but you've beaten them consistently the past two years. The Browns, I think, will have a better defense, but you should beat them too. The Vikings in week seven, you should beat them too. Like there's no reason for a slow start. None. Unless every game is played in a monsoon like we saw in week one last year. Other than that, Let's go, boys. Five and two should be the, what they start minimum. Because I, I think, spoiler alert, I think they lose to the Steelers. I think it's too tough of a first week matchup. I think TJ is going to go off. I think it's a bad matchup for week one with how bad this team starts seasons. But I think they lose that. But then the next three, they better win those. And then the next three, they should win two out of three at minimum. That makes them five and two, even though they dropped week one. Like that should be the baseline. Five five and two is the floor for a start with this schedule. If they're worse than that, like what the hell is going on? Kyle Shanahan, maybe don't coach till week eight. If this is going to happen <laughs> every year, find an assistant coach to coach. You know, I'm, I'm kidding on that, but like they got to figure it out. You, you can't keep doing this. You can't keep putting yourself behind the eight ball and then deciding, Okay, now we'll play for real. Right. Now we'll just beat everybody. Five and five and three at worst. Because you got five the Bengals eight. in week eight. Well, five yeah. and three at worst going into the bye in week nine. And then week nine is a is a tie because they play the Niners, right? According to that helmet. Okay. Why would they put the helmet there? I didn't put it there. The 49ers website did. <laughs> Leave me alone. The helmet on a bye week. There's no opponent. Jags in week 10. Trevor Lawrence is good, but you should beat the Jags. You should crush the Buccaneers because their quarterback situation stinks. You've whooped the Seahawks three straight times. Whoop them. Whoop them again. And then you got the Eagles in week 13. That's why I say this game could be for the number one seed because they should be, if we're giving them five and three going into the bye, if you want to say they drop one of those games against the Jags, Bucks, and Seahawks, to be fair, then you're talking about seven and four going into the Eagles game. That's why that game is going to decide the number one seed in the NFC. Put it this way. They, they have a pretty darn easy schedule. They have lots of travel. So it might be one that makes it kind of a little harder than you would think. Just looking at the opponents, but looking at these opponents, there's no reason they're not at least 11 wins like that. That to me is the minimum. I'm going to be a little disappointed if they're 11 and six, 12 and five, is where I'm like, okay, I accept it. I'm not disappointed. 13 and 4 is kind of what I expect. And 14 and 3 is where I'm hoping. That's what I hope for. 14 and 3 would be incredible. I'm just trying to look really quick because I don't think 11 wins is not going to be enough to get you the number one seed in the NFC. The Eagles had 14 wins last year, obviously, to be the number one seed. The Packers and the Bucks both had 13 wins in 2021. In 2020, it was the Niners. No, the Packers were 13 and three. They were the number one seed again. So like 11 wins is not going to get it done. If you want to be the top yeah. seed, you got to win 12, 13, 14 games. Right. So 13, 13 tends to be where the one seed is yeah. in a 16 game schedule. That's normally where your top seed was. They were at 13 wins, 13 and three. Uh, sometimes 14 and two, but 13 and three was normally your one seed 14 and three. Then was 17 games to where you need to be. If you want the one seed, you better be 14 and three. If you go 13 and four, like the Niners did last year, you're opening the door for somebody else or and leaving we, the door open, depending on how you want to look at. We will see what happens. We are less than two weeks from the start of real training camp in earnest when the veterans report and everything goes, uh, starts to get underway. We will be with you. I will start 49ers and five back up. By the way, people have been asking me if you missed my tweet about it. I always take a little bit of a break between mini camp and training camp, both because there's, there's no news basically coming out. And for my own mental health, I could use the break. 
Once training camp starts, 49ers and five will be back. So we'll have that for you. Jason and Steph are going to training camp. So they will be there. We will have boots on the ground in training camp, letting you know what's happening, who looks good, who doesn't look good. We are going to be there for you. We have the best 49ers coverage out of anybody out there. I don't care what anybody else says, and we will prove it to you this season. And again, we're less than two weeks from, from getting rolling. It's exciting. You made this our longest normal episode ever. Yeah. Just because I've been working so much. You did this on purpose. I did. I totally. It wasn't me rambling and cutting you off like I just did on purpose again. (laughs) Well, here's the thing. (laughs) I had a little, I had an old fashioned during the show. See, the glass is now empty now. So that may have contributed to my wordiness. I fully admit. (laughs) Um. But anyway, before we run, again, like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all the support. We're over 4,000 subscribers. We appreciate that. Check out the new website, goldstandardniners.com. I just wrote about the Debo hanging up on the radio host situation, if you want to go check that out. Plus, I'm working on uh, all my observations from this Play Callers podcast because there's a bunch of stuff that stuck out to me. I have like pages of notes from the thing, so I'm going to write that up for you. So again, goldstandardniners.com. Levin claims he's going to write for the website. He's written a <laughs> total of one article for the website. So I'm just saying that may be a thing. I, I know. I, I know you pay me a lot of money to write for that website. I Not do. There I. But yes, I will be writing regularly here, probably starting next week. It's just been hell for <laughs> the last month of, uh, with the amount of work I've had. Because, you know, I'm, I'm in school too. So I had a lot of school stuff. And now this past week, actual day job work stuff but uh that should be settling down and i want to write damn it (laughs) let's get this up and running if you want to support the show you can become a youtube channel member or we have a patreon page gold standard 49ers podcast network go and check that out we can also send in my venmo account it is (laughs) (laughs) well done uh but anyway thank you all for the support and let's go. We're, we're coming up on it here. We're getting ready to get rolling again. So we'll talk to you next week.